<laughs> Father, we love you. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for this night. <clears throat> we thank you for this chance, Lord, to be in your house, worshiping spirit and truth. I ask you to touch every prayer request, spoken and spoken alike, Lord. Yes, Jesus. There's many needs, but God, you're a great God, and, and many needs do not bother you. You're not up in heaven wringing your hands, sucking on Maylocks. You know what's got to happen, and you can make it happen. And we thank you for it right now. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for answered prayers. And this day, all we do, we're going to do is glorify and honor you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 There's something to say. Go ahead, sister. So many times, my God has helped me. When I fell on the back porch, I could not get up. I could not even wiggle. Mm. I was on my arm. Mm -hmm. There was nothing that I could pull up on. And all of a sudden, when I realized, I was standing straight up. And I don't know how I got up. You asked the Lord, though, you said. Oh, yeah, you. when I fell, I asked him to help me because it was 1230 at night. And the porch light wasn't working. And I knew that he was going to have to help me. And that was it. That's the last thing I remember. And the next thing I remember, I was standing straight up. And I walked in, <clears throat> I opened the back storm door, and I walked straight to my recliner. And I sat down. I didn't struggle. I sat down in my recliner, and I thought, well, what am I going to do? All this snow, there can't. I don't know what to do. They don't want nobody to ride, drive in this snow. <clears throat> and I picked up the phone and I dialed 911 and I told them who I was and what I'd done and what could I, what, what can I do? Well, the lights were going on and off and the phone was doing this and that and other <clears throat> and she said to hang in there and don't that she would continue to get up, keep up with me. And she said, I'm going to send you some help. And by and by, this young lady was at my front door. She couldn't hardly get in because of the snow. And she came in and began to help me. And she said, the rescue squad was coming. And I said, oh, yeah. And they, they came in. And help me. And so God is good. But an angel stood me straight up. Straight up, Pastor. That's awesome. That's awesome. I couldn't. I was on my arm. I could not wiggle. I could not move. Nothing. Isn't that something? I was good at it. I couldn't. Awesome. I should remember trying to get up, but... I asked God to help me, and, and he st that stood me straight up. I don't even remember getting up. I was standing the next thing I knew. Wow. Now that's something, Pastor. That's powerful. I was standing just as straight <clears throat> as Eddie's standing right now, and I didn't even have to hold on anything from the back door all the way to my recliner. That's awesome. And this elbow was shattered. Mm. Now, <clears throat> that's amazing. Mm. That's God. That's right. That's right. He stood me straight up, just like that, and just <clears throat> like you'd walk from there to the office door. Mm -hmm. He took care of me till they got there. That's awesome. So, told me what to do, took care of my whole thing. I probably would have just, <coughs> I don't know, I could have froze to death out there. Well, somebody did just recently. There's some people, that, uh, there was a child that went outside. Mm -hmm. uh, was it last, was it reported yesterday or the day before? 
a child, I think it was yesterday. Another child? A child went outside, and I don't know exactly where, somewhere in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. and a child went outside, a two-year-old, and the parents weren't paying attention, and the two-year-old went outside and froze to death. Yep. Oh, my gosh. People. Oh, last one I've heard about was that one Benny them that. That's just, a, I, I, don't, I don't know how somebody can't see. And then uh, the Super Bowl night, uh, I'll tell you something about the Super Bowl, too. I believe... I believe the reason Tom Brady didn't win is that the Eagles made it like they did because the Eagles were way, way down, way down for years. <clears throat> and they rebuilt the team, and they rebuilt the Christians. They're all Christians. When, they're, when they're giving them, giving them the best Lombardi trophy, they were, the very first thing the coach says, I want to give glory to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Y'all saw it, and all of them. But you know what the quarterback says? I read today, you know what the quarterback said? His highest aspiration was, and he was getting ready to quit football because he couldn't get a good job as a quarterback. And so he and he went out on a camping trip and his cousin or his brother wasn't taught him in to try one more time. So he tries one more time and goes to Philadelphia as a backup quarterback. The quarterback gets in trouble, gets hurt, so he gets up there and he went from going to quit to being MVP. Oh. And and he said that his greatest aspiration is not to win the Super Bowl. His greatest aspiration is to be a pastor. Oh my gracious. His name, his name is Nick and they call him St. Nick. Yeah, it's too little. You don't know, be able to see it. Super Bowl champion Eagles use their fame to praise God. Um, Isn't that cool? Yes, there's there's a like a four minute video. A friend had sent it to me. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. There it is. That's amazing. Amen. That's so awesome. Whoopee. That's awesome. That's amazing. They do Bible study together. They, I mean, it, the the video tells the, the things that they and they have a a, a a night with couples night where their wives come and. Uh. Because, see, they practice even on Sunday, so they have a chapel service right, right there. Couple Bible studies, Saturday nights they get together for the game and they have a prayer. They said somebody, I think, met them on something that they didn't have. That nobody nailed at this game. Is that true? Nobody what? Nailed. Nailed. Took the knee. I don't know, I didn't see that part. They said that they didn't. Good. Also, there was a prayer of them praying through the Lord's Prayer together the whole team after they won. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're chatting. They have a, they have a team chatting. Here, here, here. Anyway, I'm going to stop it right there because it's like, it, the rest of it is like baptisms. That That's awesome. You know, during Desert Storm, uh, I talked, let's see, was it, was it me? I think, I, I think, yeah. We had a guy come after Desert Storm to our church, and I'm trying to remember how he was connected. But he said they ordered, they ordered like 5,000. At Desert Storm, they had ordered several thousand coffins to send men back home in after the invasion. And said there was only just a couple of hundred, and that was, there was more. There was more killed in training exercises than there were in Desert Storm. Hmm. Uh, and he said that the chaplains took those coffins and filled them with water and baptized the soldiers. That's cool. That's so so cool. <laughs> also, we're y'all didn't know that we were all famous because uh, Fountain Boats were the very were the very first boats to hit. Kuwait in Desert Storm. Oh, really? They were used by the Navy SEALs. 
So we were the very first ones to, to start. The, we started the attack. Found bugs. Isn't that cool? That's just a little gem that means nothing, but means a lot. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> let's go ahead and start this. Number four, we're going to just kind of go through because y'all been through all of them, so we're just going to kind of, but, but just in case, take this home with you. I didn't put all the other at the beginning, but I just put each one of them. And next week I'll have, I'll have all five of them up there, but I'll have this really kind of slim and put number five down there full. But, but, but people can, can let, I, I, was, I, was, um, I was talking with somebody recently. And they're talking about how hard school was for some people nowadays, high school, and talking about some of the stuff seemed to be really, really tough and really hard. And and and, and I, I just asked them, I said, well, let me ask you a question. Is it that the work's getting harder or is it that we're getting softer, the millennials? You know, it's not, it's not just one place. It's every place where they've got a bunch of millennials in there. The millennials will come in. And it's like they didn't want to get paid for being there, and they and they've been there in the generation. They got a trophy for showing up. They didn't do anything. They got a trophy for showing up, and they go to work, and they want to sit and talk and carry on. And when you come up, they act like they're being disturbed. They're, what, Bethany? And you're de decaffeinated water. Oh yeah, I I went to Arby's one night, <laughs> and we were ordering our food. And I said, I like two glasses of water, too. We don't drink soft drinks. I just want two glasses of water. And she said, okay. And I said, make sure. I said, is that water decaffeinated? <laughs> and the girl said, I'm not sure, sir. I'm about to check. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> she, so no, I'm not question. kidding. So she goes to her manager and says, is that water decaffeinated? She says, I'm not sure. I'm going to have to check. Oh, my word. <laughs> Oh and so she comes to these millennials. They come back to me and say, we'll have to find out and let you know. So Lynn and I are sitting there and eating. And Linda said, when I asked Linda, said, make sure you remember, he asked you, not me. Don't spit in my sandwich. <laughs> 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 well, so then, so then, uh, yeah, so, so we sat down and we need some more water. So I go in. Uh, yeah, so I go in later on to get some more water. And nobody's up front but one person. I said, where's everybody at? And I looked, and they were all in the back room. And I said, what are they doing? She said, they're having a meeting trying to find out if this water's decaffeinated or not. Oh, <laughs> Linda said, will you please stop that? Don't ask me anymore. But, but it got me one day because I went to the Chinese hibachi place in Chocolatey, and, and I got one water. She came out and gave me some more. She said, more water? And I said, yes, I'd like some more water, please. I said, well, what? Decaffeinated this time. She said, what? I said, decaffeinated. She said, decaffeinated? I said, decaffeinated. She comes back and brings me. I went, went to drink it, and it was <coughs> sizzle. I went and drink it. It was awful. She went and got me soda water. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to tell her next time I go in there, because I talk to her all the time. I talk with them all the time. I'm going to tell her. I asked her one time, asked him one time if he knew you. Uh -huh. He couldn't remember. I said, next time I'll say, it was the man that wanted to decaffeinate <laughs> water. <laughs> oh, you mean that place shopping in? Oh, yeah, I talked to him the other day. We had a good long talk. He's a good guy. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. Here we go. Uh, problems. A lot of people, like I told that, those people, and I said, and I told them, I said, now, again, do you think it's because the problems are getting harder or, or people are getting softer? And right to start with, they didn't know what to say. And then I said, I just want you to sit back and think about some things. And then these people have gone through some rough things. And I said, y'all actually, y'all were young, but y'all lived two lifetimes because of the hard things you've gone through. So <clears throat> what may not seem hard to you, it seems hard to some others that's never had to go through anything. I said, just remember, the stuff you go through has tempered you and made you strong. And you just remember that. This, God never wastes your pain. God does not waste pain. So uh, here it is. Five ways, and of course, I'm just going to go through the first three pretty quick, and then we're just going to number four. Number one, God uses problems to direct you. Sometimes he likes a fire runner to get you moving. Uh, he uses problems to direct you. Number two, he uses problems to inspect you. We're like tea bags. You never know what's inside of us. And, you know, tea bags can brag about how strong you are, but until you get in hot water, you can't tell. And... Uh, <clears throat> And, like, and that goes back, I remember when Daniel went to Afghanistan, he said, Daddy, 
if we ever had to go out on some hard stuff, he said, I did not want a new guy with me. He said, because when the new, you know, those guys, those guys will, will leave you hanging. There was one time they got stopped, and the, and the, 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 the Afghan police are very, very corrupt. And they had already reached in before and take, took his gun. And his, his commander said, don't you ever let it happen again. You hold on to that gun no matter what the price. You hold on to that gun. So they had the next stop, and they held on. They, he went and grabbed Daniel's gun. And so Daniel said, you're not getting it. And so they started arguing, and the driver was an Afghan. He said, the driver is interpreting what that guy is saying. And this is, Daniel's hollering back at the interpreter, telling him what to tell him. So the guy's interpreting both for both of them. And he says, let go. And he said, I'm not letting go. You tell him to let go of my gun. Blah, 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 blah. And all and these police are all around the car. They got it surrounded. And so all of a sudden, you hear a little click. And all the guys run. All the police just run. They scream and run. And the guy in the back was a Brit. And the guy in the back told the driver, drive, 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 drive. And Daniel don't know what's going on. And they drive. When they get down the road a little bit out of the way of the police, he says, stop, stop, stop. He says, Daniel, come back here and help me find my pen. The guy had taken a, a hand grenade and pulled the pen yeah. and, and held it up and said, we all go. And the guys ran. Mm -hmm. And so, so Daniel said, so Daniel held to find the pen to stick back in. And Daniel said, next time you decide to do that, how about? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll see you. Yeah, 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 let me know what you're doing here before you start pulling pins and hand grenades. <laughs> you know, can you let go? We're going out of here. <clears throat> but again, mm -hmm. again, an idiot. <laughs> but that, that guy knew what to do to get him out of trouble because he'd been in it before. And Daniel didn't know because Daniel hadn't been in it before. You know, So Daniel's arguing with the guy, and that guy sends the guys off running. So, of course, mm -hmm. Daniel learned because later on, I remember Daniel telling me he was going on a mission. And I said, what you going to do? He said, well, I got a grenade. <laughs> I said, no, 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 we're not doing that. Okay, so... He uses problems to direct you, problems to inspect you, problems to correct you. Uh, some lessons we're going to learn through pain and failure. Uh, with me, as hard hit as I am, it seems like every time I turn around, God has to teach me the hard way. My mom would say when I was little, she'd say, you're not going to learn unless God just teaches you the hard way, are you, son? And now I got all my kids are the same way. Look at them one back there just like <laughs> but I got two. I got two, two boys that I'm going to tell you what. If, that, that, if you look up hard hit in the encyclopedia, there's no name, there's no words, it's just got a picture of Larry Curly and Moe. Excuse me, D.C. Daniel and Bethany, Larry Curly and Moe. <laughs> he, he was never like that, was he, Bethany? <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to ask his daddy. Oh, no, that's my daddy. sweet little girl sitting back there, she don't give you no problem. <laughs> I love you, Miss Kitty. <laughs> I like no matter it, how it. much trouble I get into, I'm always the innocent one in her eyes. <laughs> I, I like her way. playful use of the double naked. Do that. You ain't need any worse than that. She don't give you <laughs> no trouble. That's right. But, but, but she loves you so much. Yes, yeah, she does. Okay. And it's only by her because I love that, her. That, 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 that takes care of it all. Yep. Okay. He was a he was a good little boy. <laughs> I was I was so bright. My mom and daddy called me son. <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 they loved you so much. My mama said my mama said that my, I had twin brothers behind me, and then I had my little sister. And my mama said that my twin brothers had been if I had been my twin brother, she would have probably had just went out and mm -hmm. done, she'd have gone crazy because mm -hmm. she could have stood two of me. And I said, Mama, I was just breaking you in right. <laughs> Getting you ready for those twins. Okay. So now, God uses problems to protect you. Now, now we're going to talk about some wild things tonight. But I'm talking about how God protects you. And Sister Kitty with her arm, this is a, a big thing because Sister Kitty was protected on that step. She could have passed out and froze to death. That's right. Or she could have laid there and froze to death because she couldn't get up. But God picked her up. And so, Amen. and even right now, she got that bionic arm. Mm hmm I mean, she does like the bonnet woman. When she walks by here, go do 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 <laughs> like the bonnet man. So here we're gonna get, get ready because we're gonna take a little take a little history ride, and when you, and maybe we can see things a little different that happened to some people. A problem can be a blessing in disguise if it prevents you from being harmed by something more serious. I think very strongly. Daddy was working out of town, and 
he was looking up, and one of his guys was a couple of, I don't know, probably 12 foot ahead of, up above him. And the guy dropped a wrench. And Daddy looked up, and it hit him right here. And he got, oh my gosh. He got a bunch of stitches. Oh. But Daddy dries himself, tells the guys keep working. Daddy's the superintendent there. Daddy says, y'all keep on working. Daddy goes to the hospital, emergency room to get it sewed up. And the doctor says, who drove you here? He said, I did. It's just a cut eye. I just held something over. He goes, no, that's not what I'm talking about. He said, that's all I got is a cut eye. He said, your blood pressure. He said, you're about to pop. He said, I cannot believe how high your blood pressure is. He says, do you take blood pressure medicine? He said, no, sir. He said, well, you will after today. And he put Daddy on blood pressure medicine. So... That injury actually protected my dad. And we got found out his high blood pressure and then he live a lot longer because he could have had a heart attack with that high blood pressure. I know some other people <clears throat> that had some there was one guy who was praying to God to help him and he said he said and he, he he did everything that he thought, crossed all his T's, dotted all his I's, and he was on the way to the hospital to minister to somebody. Mm-hmm. As he's crossing the street, a wild car comes by and runs over him. And, and now he's in the lane in the emergency room, and he says, why, Lord, did you let me do this? I mean, I've done everything I can to serve you, and now I've gone out of my way to go minister to somebody, and on the way to minister to somebody, I get run over. Mm. And I got all these broken bones. Mm. I don't understand it, God. Then the doctor comes in and says, tells the man, says, look, I know you're here for these broken bones. He said, but we've got to run some more tests. He said, okay. So he comes back in. And he's told the man, Mr. Smith, he said, Mr. Smith, I hate to tell you this. He said, but you've got cancer. you got a tumor. Mm. And the man said, I didn't know it. He said, well, you better thank God that you got hit by this car because if you get hit by this car, let me find this tumor. And he says, honestly, we found it soon enough that we can take it out and it won't hurt you. Because by the time he would have failed it, it would have been too far gone. Mm. So, again, a lot of times we think things are or problems or curses, but it actually the problem is a blessing in disguise. And here's an example. I was told about a guy who was fired for refusing to do something unethical that his boss had asked him to do. He got fired because he wouldn't do it. So his unemployment was a problem. Couldn't find a job, finally got a job, blah, 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 all his problems. But then he realized being fired saved him. Because it kept him from being sent to prison a year later when management's actions were actually discovered and the manager and everybody went to prison. He didn't. Hmm. So that was a so him being fired actually and he was doing something good. His being fired actually helped him. Go ahead, sister. A problem can be a blessing in disguise if it puts you exactly where God needs you to be. That's right. I had a friend that I run into Saturday night. They have um um elected the first poet laureate for Eastern North Carolina Saturday night. It was at the Arts Council building. Angela Silverthorne, I don't know if anybody else knows oh, yeah. her. She is a <laughs> sweetie. But um, they were in for the poet laureate thing. I thought they moved. They did they move. Did. They sold their house because their daughter and her son-in-law, their third child, was dead. And they were a bit overwhelmed. And so they decided, since they were retired, they'd sell their house here and they would move there. That's awesome. At least temporarily. To help them out with the, with this deaf child. Well, right after they got there, they discovered that the son-in-law has got stage three prostate cancer. So, and that's what Angela said. She says we're exactly where we need to yeah, be. Yeah, that's awesome. She said, that they were there. That's not the reason we went there. She said, but but yeah. we're there. God knew. That's yeah, right. God knew. That's right. That's just amazing. Are you ready in her books? And they're great people. Yes, mm-hmm. I have. Oh yeah. Well, see, I, I've been in a writers group with her for years. I the that it, uh, the Pamco Writers Group was what was sponsoring the poet laureate thing, and she's a member of the Pamco Writers Group, so she decided to come in for the program. So that's, that's cool. Wow. I mean, yeah. it's not good that he's got cancer, but no. it's cool how what happened. Yeah, how I was going to say, because we, we were discussing, you know, being at a place in life that we didn't plan to be several years ago, but you're, you know, well, but you know that that's where you're supposed to be right now. That's so. right. And it's like, it's like, now I'm going to give you, just like you said, we're going to talk about three people, just three, and then we're going to call it quits for tonight. And these three people, the first person we're going to talk about is Joseph. Now, now, I've heard some preachers say there are 
that out of all the people in the Bible, there was at least one person that never had a problem, but still had adversity, but he didn't have a, he didn't really have a problem. Well, and the more I studied it, and the more I studied psychology, the more I see Joseph had a problem. Joseph had a big problem. Okay, Joseph's problem was pride. Joseph walked out saying, I've got a dream. He kept telling his brothers, one day y'all going to bow to me, and the world's going to bow to me. I got this dream. And on top of it, his daddy favored him. So, he, so his brothers get to see his daddy favoring him, the coat of many colors. And, and he's talking about, I got a dream. I've had a dream. God's going to use me. God's going to use me. And he's the youngest one. And so just, just because of his daddy's position with him, that already put him in a bad spot. But he had pride. He kept talking about how God's going to use him. Well, his brothers actually uh, threw him in a pit. They were going to kill him. But Reuben came along and said, no, we're not going to kill him. We're just going to just take him and put him in here, and we'll take his, his garment and we'll cover it with blood and from a wild animal, and we'll tell Dad that the wild animals ate him. Mm. Okay. And then they sell him into slavery, thinking they're through with him. All right, so here, here was a cure for pride, though. See, God did have this very powerful, powerful ministry coming. So God had to prepare him by getting the pride out of his life. So how did he get the pride out of his life? The very first thing he is, he's thrown in the pit. I mean, he's dreaming, I'm going to be king of the world, and he's thrown in the pit. And then to make matters even, even uh, take more pride from him, then he's sold as a slave to Potiphar. And why is there as a slave to Potiphar? Potiphar's wife tries to have sex with him, and because he won't do it, she claims that he tried to rape her. And so now he winds up in prison. Talk about getting rid of pride. I'm in a pit. I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm, a, I'm a slave. And now I'm lied on, and I'm thrown in prison. And then when he's in prison, the Bible says that he was actually had his feet in stocks. He was, it just wasn't some of these the prisons like some of the guys from Watergate went to, which had golf, golf courses and, mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And so, uh, uh, while he's in prison, they finally, about the eighth year, they come along and say, and he gives the dream for the baker and the butler, and, uh, and of course, the baker died just like he said, the butler was released just like he said, and he said, I'll tell him, I'll tell, tell Pharaoh about you when I get out to get you out of here. Well, the, the baker forgets. So, is there two more years? You tell me if that won't take the pride out of it. So, here's what happened. When the favor has his dream, uh, the baker goes, oh, yeah. I mean, the butler says, oh, yeah, I know somebody can interpret that. And so he goes, and uh, uh, tells the Pharaoh, and Pharaoh goes and gets him. And then one day he goes from the, from the, when he's ready, when pride is no longer an issue. And one day he goes from the prison to the palace and becomes second in command to Pharaoh, hmm. responsible to nobody but Pharaoh, and everybody else was responsible to him. That was one of the most powerful positions in the entire world. So God knew he did not need pride in what he was doing. Uh, uh, and so here it is, it says, uh, uh, now later on, he's, he's, he's actually got his brothers there, and he's revealing himself to his brothers, and when he reveals himself to his brothers, uh, uh, verse, 20, verse 20, it says, You intended to harm me. He said, uh, he said Don't be afraid, for, I'm in the uh, for, uh, for am I in the place of God? But it says, his, his, his pride's gone. I'm not God. His pride's gone. But as for you, you meant evil against him, but God meant it for good in order to bring about, as it is in this day, to save many people alive. Mm -hmm. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I'll provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly. To them. See, now pride's gone. If pride had been an issue, he couldn't have spoken to his brothers that way. He would have, he would have attacked them. He could have, he could have, he could have said, and their head would have been gone. Remember me telling you about, not long ago, a service ago, service two ago, about the guy that was cussing me uh, in powder coat. He was cussing me every chance he got, called me names, all kinds of things. And, and all I had to do, honestly, all I had to do was say the word, and he'd have been gone. But I just kept, I just kept, Said, Lord, open a door so I can minister to this man. And that's when those two boats came in that were bad, and he was being blamed for it. He was going to get fired, but instead I kept searching and searching. I find out that it wasn't him. It was the guy before him, and and we became 
awesome friends from that time on. Awesome, awesome friends. So see, so, so again, when we let pride get in the way, a lot of things happen. So, so, uh, and one thing about pride, a lot of times we don't see it. When we're proud, we don't see it. Somebody else can, but we don't. His brother saw it, he didn't. So, so here we go. Uh, God protected Joseph as he was delivering him from pride. God protected him by allowing him to be in the prison for 10 years. Wow. God protected him by him being in that prison. Now, it doesn't seem like it. But well, you sit back and look at all the way things went and the way things were going. If, if he'd have got out two years early, he'd have been gone and Pharaoh couldn't have found him. He was right where he needed to be when God was ready to use him. So God protected him in that prison. The second person, and this one here, uh, this one here, I think I probably fall in with him more than anybody else, I reckon, is, uh, <clears throat> is, is Jonah. See, so when we say one more thing about, about, one thing about uh, Jake, I mean uh, Joseph, God protected him and propelled him in that prison. He protected him and propelled him to the throne. Yeah, yeah. Now he didn't see it. He was in he was in rags, mm -hmm. but he was he was God was going to propel him. Sometimes we're sitting there and wondering, this don't look like I don't feel like I'm doing something ain't right, God. I don't feel like you're, you're really helping me out here. And if you just hold on, you got to remember, you can't judge the whole book by one chapter. You can't judge the whole book by one paragraph. You got to judge the outcome of that book by going all the way through it. It's like this: if I gave you one piece of a one piece of a puzzle and said I put, what's this? You couldn't tell me. If I give you most of the puzzle, you might put it together, but still can't 100 percent figure it out. You got to have the whole picture with uh, figure it out. God sees the whole picture from the beginning and the end. Okay? So he can use problems to protect us. So Jonah. Now, now Joseph's problem was pride. Jonah's problem was twofold. And that was he was disobedient, but he was also defiant. There's a difference in disobedience and defiance. Disobedience, he just wouldn't go to Nineveh. That's disobedience. But defiance is he went 2,000 miles the other way to Joppa. Okay? That's one thing being disobedient just by not doing it. You could say like being disobedient is a sin of omission. But when you're defiant, it's the sin of commission because now you're doing something. So Jonah is, is, is defiant and disobedient. So this is so awesome. Why he's off on this ship and he gets thrown over and we won't go through the whole thing. But I will say this. They, uh, if you look over here, uh, verse 10, there was a great storm. I'll just, I'll just read it to you. It says, so the captain, this, this is in Jonah chapter 1, verse 6. So the captain came to him and said, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Says, it's a great storm. Perhaps your God will consider us that we may not perish. And they said one to another, come let us cast lots that we may know what, what, whose cause this trouble came upon us. So they cast lots, and they fell on Jonah. Then, the, then they said to him, Please tell us, for what causes this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and what people who are you? And he said, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, and the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Hmm. Then the men were exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, why, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord. Remember... Disobedience is just not doing it. Defiance is when you run. Okay? Now, now a lot of people, a lot of people don't realize it, but they've gone beyond disobedience and now they're in defiance when they're running from what God's got them for. Okay. Because he had told them, then he said to them, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with the innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as you, as you please you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him in the sea, and the sea ceased from raging. 
Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now, even in his defiance, God was being glorified. But here's the part I want to get at. This is the part about protection. And, and Sister Vicki hit the head on strong right at the very beginning. Here it is. Now, the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Now, now remember, he prepared a great fish. That word prepared is so awesome. It's such a, such a, a powerful word. Because that word prepared means literally to reckon or to count. So, so God took Jonah, knew exactly what size he was, had, had a fish prepared. He counted all of it. He had all different dimensions and everything. So that fish would be big enough to hold him and not kill him. So God reckoned. I mean, God prepared. God reckoned. He started thinking. So he had the perfect fish and the perfect timing. When they threw him overboard, the fish came up and got him. Mm -hmm. God's timing. Okay? So then, so, 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 so that, that's the second word in, in prepared. Prepared first means to, to make it the right size. The second word is to appoint, which means to make it happen at the right time. And so he prepared the fish. And the fish came up at the right time and, and got a hold of Jonah. So now, again, uh, he was in there for three days and three nights before he even realized what was going on. I don't think it would took me three days and three nights. I think I might could have figured it out from the very beginning. <laughs> As I'm going down to fish, I'd say something. But the Bible says he was in there three days and three nights. Then the Lord prayed, then Jonah prayed to the Lord as God from the fish's belly. See, see God protected him. He was disobedient and defiant. But God still used him to bring a revival in a boat. God used him. Uh, he prepared a great fish so he would not die in that water. He couldn't have survived. He would not have survived in that water. So God God protected him. Out of that, that, so he cried out of his affliction. And he also told the Lord, he said, he said, I've been in the belly of hell. He said, but now I will pay my vows. I will do what I said. I realize I was wrong. I will do what I said. So the Bible says in chapter uh, uh, 3, which is pretty cool, after he said, okay, uh, Lord, I realize I messed up. I've been defiant. I've been disobedient. I will be obedient now. I will go to Nineveh. And so the Bible says in chapter 3, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. That's grace. How many times has God had to come to you the second time? Mm -hmm. And the third. Mm -hmm. And the fourth. And the oh, fifth. Mm -hmm. He's bringing a hammer by then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that's why I got knots on my head. And, and preached it, and preached the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose. Uh, oh, so here we go. Uh, oh, that here, chapter two. Verse 10, so the Lord spoke to the fish after he said, I will pay my vows. The Bible says that the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah on the dry land. Now, this is what's so cool is it vomited him up right at Nineveh. So God used that protection to get him where he belonged. It protected mm. him. The fish protected him. It was his prison. And put him right where he right, that's right. It was his prison because he said it was the belly of hell. But it was also his protection and it was also his transportation because it put him right where he needed to be. Some of us right now don't realize that some things we think is actually we're in the belly of hell don't realize the stuff we're going through is actually protecting us and is, is propelling us and putting us in the right place at the right time so we can be ready when we, when we, get, when we get vomited out. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so, again, so God spoke to him a second time. He went to Nineveh and the whole place was saved. So, again, God uses problems to protect you. And number three, uh, now Joseph's problem was pride. Jonah's problem was disobedience and defiance. Then there's Jeremiah, not the bullfrog. <laughs> <laughs> he was a friend of mine. <laughs> 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 that's awesome. <laughs> that's a fucking cornhole that you would say. I know. I know, but that was awesome. I reckon that's why I like it so good. It was cornball. It was cornball, yeah. Yeah. So here we go. His problem was the same problem that, that, that Timothy had, and that was timidity or fear or anxiety. Okay? If you look in the very beginning of, of when he's getting called, the very, very beginning, if you if you Look, look at Jeremiah, 
It, it, it amazes me because right from the dead get God know God knew who he was getting when he. It's not like God went. Now if I knew this, I wouldn't have asked you. No, he already knew this. And because of what what he, because his because his message was such a powerful message, and he was going to have to preach so long without having any results. He needed a guy like like Jeremiah. But here it is, Jeremiah. Then the word of the Lord came unto me saying. Before I formed thee in the belly, this is in chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou comest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. Wow. Isn't that something? He said, I, I, I can't, I, I, I cannot command, I cannot do what you're asking me to do, for I am a child, or I'm immature, I, 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 I'm this is way beyond my ability to handle. And so, but the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid. Here it is the timidity. So remember, remember he has fear, he's, and, and he's, he's, got, he's timid. He says, again, he's afraid. He's, he, he says, Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to, to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. The Lord said to me, Behold, I put my words in thy mouth. Now, Jeremiah goes out and starts doing his thing, and Jeremiah actually is a very hated man. He's called the weeping prophet. He's a very hated man. He's, 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 had, he's had some rough places to go. Has, he's worked a long, long time and sees very, very little success. So here's one of the major prophets but it's not seeing any profit. <laughs> there goes one of those cornball things. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so uh, here's what happens. He's preaching. And in chapter 38, he's preaching and gets thrown in prison. He gets thrown in the pit. And so while he's in this pit, it seems like, well, is this any way to treat God's prophet? I'm thrown in the pit. So why he's thrown in the pit, and I just I just abbreviate it. In chapter thirty nine, uh, uh, the Babylonians come and destroy Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. They take King Zedadiah and they put out his eyes. Some bad stuff's going on. But because Jeremiah is safely tucked away in the pit, they can't get to him. Wow. Again, sometimes God uses problems to protect us. If he hadn't have been in that pit, he'd have died with all those people. And so after the invasion, they came to look down and see he's in the pit. And now the king of Babylon has mercy on him and picks him up and sends him on his way. So, again, we see problems one way, God sees it another. We see problems, I tell people all the time, uh, I tell them this at the prison, I get them to pray this at the prison, I do this all the time other places, is what you think is a stop sign, God's only using it as a speed bump. Just to slow you down, to make you think. Or to slow you down so he can do his job. So, again, God protect his servant through the enemy invasion, just like he promised in chapter 1, I will take care of you. The Babylonians released him from imprisonment and placed him in the care of, of Gedaliah, the son of Jeremiah's friend, uh, Ahiakim. So, so, and he also protected uh, Jeremiah's friends. So, again, you look at Joseph, pride. Jonah, disobedience and defiance. Jeremiah, timidity and fear. But no matter what you see, God used problems to protect them and to perfect them. That's pretty. That's pretty awesome. He used them to to to, perfect, to protect them and uh, uh, perfect them. And you know what perfecting means? It doesn't mean it makes you perfect. It means it makes you mature. And so this to make it mature. Anybody got any questions? Isn't this some awesome stuff about how God takes your problems and uses something, to make something great out of it? Wow. Anybody got any questions? Any any comments? I don't have anything on this, but I wanted to tell you something I heard last night. Um, I didn't make it to a prison ministry meeting uh, Saturday because I was hurting so bad. But I heard that 
they were not going to let be let Jehovah's Witnesses go in to Green and Eastern where we go anymore. Was well, that? At least for six months because they're causing so much problems when they take the the girls out, you know, for the day or something, and take them to the to church and teach them what they do. The girls are coming back in and saying they can't do this and that. So they've decided not to let Jehovah's Witness go in there. Well, we have to, at the moment, at the moment, we have to let them in at Fifth Detention Center, but like I told them, and, and, and we we just had a, a guy, again, because of state laws, we can't tell them no uh, until something like that happens, and you, then you've got the right to protect everything. But that, So Sister Boone said, We'll stick with Brother Dave and his group. And I said, I really wouldn't like that. And she said, well, Brother, I don't know. I, I, your group is the one I trust the most. And so we're in there with this Jehovah's Witnesses. And and all I can think of is the guy told me, I, so I carried him in, before I went out, I carried him in the office with me. And I decided to go ahead and scare him, right to start with. And he said, so we're going to go in there, we're going to sit down and have Bible studies and this and this. I said, oh, who told you that? I said, well, we're going, you and I are going tonight, we're going to go where there's rapists and murderers and thieves and, and double double murderers and all that, which was true in the F block and over in the D block. And I said, we're going to go where the people are crazy. I said, so what I need you to do is stand beside me. And all of a sudden, he just starts going, he said, I'm used to, I don't know why. I said, we're going to go from cell to cell. And he goes, from cell to cell. I said, in D block we are. He goes, that's not what they told me. I said, well, look, you're a Jehovah's Witness. You used to knocking on doors. You can go from... <laughs> You can go from cell to cell to cell. He said, I reckon I can. I said, but you need to stay right beside me. And I said, if you start feeling uncomfortable, you just, just kind of hit me on the back of my leg. And I said, I want you to stand up against the wall and make sure your back's against the wall. And he started going. <laughs> and I said, don't worry. I've had a, And this is the truth. I've had him jump up on the table and jump at me. Mm -hmm. And I've had him slam things down at me from upstairs, slam things on me. And I... I told him, I said, when that guy, I said, here's what you got to do. When they jump on you, you got to get back in their face. I said, I had a guy jump across the table, jump across the table in front of all these guys in F block, the federal side. And he jumped right in my face and said, what was I going to do? And I said, you better sit back down. That's what you better do. I ain't going to do anything. But you're going to sit back down. I'm going to finish what I'm doing. You know, and inside I was going. <laughs> <laughs> but on the, on the outside, now I had to be John Wayne. Inside I felt like Pee Wee Herman, but on the outside... <laughs> I was being John Wayne. So he didn't have anything to lose, really. <laughs> no, no, he didn't. Hey. Yeah, no, he didn't. And so, uh, but still, that, that Joe's witness, bless his heart. By the time we got out, he had a great big smile on his face. By the time me and him started walking into those, into those doors, he was going, you could hear him. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, what I did was I carried him with me. You have to go so many times. You can't go on your own until after the fourth time. So I carried him with me every time. And now they're going to zone. And, and I told Sister Boone, I said, it's going to be a self-correcting problem when he goes in with that stuff. It's going to be a self-correcting. Unless there's Jehovah's Witness in here, he's going to minister to them because they, they, they don't want to hear us. I said, so to be good for them, I said, it'll be a self-correcting problem. I said, just watch. Just be cool. I said, because we can't stop him. And I said, if we're going to minister to everybody, we've got to minister to everybody. We minister, I minister to Satan's, Buddhist, um, uh, Catholic, and uh, uh, several other, uh, what's it called, Ref Rastafarian. Rastafarians, and uh, uh, wow, but the worst ones are the Satanists, They're the, and, and, and also uh, the Wiccans, so you ministered to all of them, and so like I told him, I said, just, just, just let, so what I did was, I carried them with me when I came to a Jehovah's Witness, I knew there were some Jehovah's Witness in there, I just stuck them with them, and said, talk to them. Minister to him. And so, uh, but he doesn't come much anymore. But that's okay, because when he does come, now he goes on his own, and everything's cool. But I think the worst person that they had to stop was not a Jehovah's Witness. There was two of them. One was a guy that thought he had to fit in with every group of people. He was a Jew to the Jews. He was a uh, 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 Muslim to the Muslims. He was a Christian to the Christians. 
and he just he just had everybody so messed up that they just finally said, I think it's better if you don't go back there. And then one guy went back there and thought that in order for him to minister to these guys, he had to talk like them. And she was back there cutting up and carrying on and cussing and cutting and talking nasty like the other guys were doing and carrying on. And they had to ask him. He was another one they had to ask him. But the problem's not been with Jehovah's Witness. The problem's been with the Christians in the in, oh. in Pitt, Pitt Detention Center. The, the ones that's caused problems oh. have been Christians. And that's sad. That's true. I bet many times, I mean, this are probably some of the, the simple ones that you have met up with, but also dangerous ones were uh, demons. Oh, there have been uh, one time I went, I went, Dan and I went, mm -hmm. and we were up in uh, in D Block, and in D Block, you, you minister one on one because they're still under cells, only one person's out at a time. F block, there's like 100 guys out at one time, all the federal guys. Yeah. But this is D block, and segregation, or uh, they still talk back and forth, they holler, they, they still got people in there, but they're in their sales. Mm -hmm. I'm down on this end talking, and Danny comes running down and says, you need to come down here quick. And That's I said, right. I said, mm -hmm. what's wrong, Danny? Mm -hmm. He said, you ain't going to believe it. Uh -huh. He said, and that guy knows you. Uh -huh. He said, go get David Linton and bring him down here. I said, I have no idea who that guy is. <laughs> he says, he knows you by your name, and he knew me by my name. I said, okay. And so he said, give me a minute. And so I finished what I was doing. I go down there, <clears throat> and the man had drawn a mural on his wall. I don't know where he got the stuff from, but it was a big old thing of Satan. The picture itself, the artist's work was, in, it was amazing, but it was Satan. And he was a Satanist, and he started talking junk. I mean, he talked all kinds of junk. Called me by my name. <clears throat> I'd never seen the guy. Called me by my whole name. Called, called Danny by his name. And I said, Dan, Danny, step on over there. So Danny stepped on over. And, and I talked with the guy for a little bit. <clears throat> and I said, uh, I said, 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 put your hand up on that window. He said, put his hand up on the window. I put my hand up on the window. And I, said, and I moved my mouth where he couldn't see me talking. And I said, Satan, this is not between me and him. This is between my God and you. That's right. I said, now, you come out in the name of Jesus. Right. And then I looked back at him, and I smiled. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you're going to get better. The next time I came in, that mess was off of his wall, and he was not talking all that junk anymore. He was not talking in that kind of voice anymore. He was, he would act like he had some sense. And from that time on, he loved for me to go talk to him. Mm -hmm. But I'd cast a demon out of him. But, mm -hmm. but that, I'd come back and Danny said, but he knew our name. Mm -hmm. And I said, Danny, calm down. I said, look, the seven sons of Sceva tried to cast a demon out of the man through Paul that Jesus preached. And he said, Paul I know and Jesus I know, but who are you? And that one man beat those seven brothers. I said, so I'm excited. I'm happy that Satan knows my name. And he knows yours, Danny. He said, I didn't think about it that way. I said, yeah. <laughs> Danny said, all right. <laughs> and, and then one night, the guys, the guy was kicking. He kicked that. He, ah, it was terrible. And I went to him. I did the same thing. And and the next time I come in, they let him out. He was out. And he was swinging back and forth, having him a good time, doing all kinds of stuff. And he came to me and said, and this is what the man said. He said, thank you so much for casting those demons out of me. He said, I've been delivered, and I love God, and I love the way I feel, and it's just awesome. He said, I can't thank you enough. But the worst one was even worse than that devil guy was the guy that had us there, and he said, he called me to his cell, and he said, he said, turn to the book of whatever, Isaiah, such and such. I said, all right. He says, I turn it, he says, now read it. So I read it, and then he goes, now kneel. And I said, excuse me? <laughs> oh yeah. He said, I said, kneel before me. Yeah. And so I said, son, it'll be a cold day in Hades <laughs> before I kneel before you. I said, my God, my Lord and Master is way over you, but don't even come there with this mess. And and from that time on, for about six months, I wasn't any other guys go, I'd go take care of them myself. One night I went up there, and I remember on Braveheart, when, they, when Braveheart went over to the other side, and they said, what's he doing? He said, he's going to pick a fight. Yeah, I, remember. <laughs> I remember that. 
a brave heart. Well, I told Brandon, I said, you stay down here, I'm going to go up there. And Brandon said, you're going to pick a fight. Well, <laughs> 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 yeah, I went there and talked to the guy, and after about six months, it took a long time for this guy. He got where he was talking. He talked so much better. He was acting like he had some sense. Then he wound up ministering to the other inmates. And one night I didn't go wake him up. He was asleep when I come by. And he started hollering. So I came back over there to him. I was walking out. He was hollering. So I went over to him and he said, he said, man, he said, don't ever go out of here without waking me up. He, you know what he told me then? It made me feel good. He said, you're my spiritual father. Yeah, it went from demon to spiritual. Uh, it was just amazing. So, so y'all have these same opportunities everywhere we go. We all do. There's there's opportunities right here in the neighborhood. There's opportunities in our families, you know, uh, to let, let our light shine. And sometimes our problems. Remember, telling you about the time that, that there was a lady at work that was. This is. A, I mean, she was she was humongous. She looked like a WWF fighter, and. And for some reason, they put her in charge of some of the parts of the shop, and I couldn't figure that one out. And I went in one Saturday, and, I, and my problem, what I was going to do is we had eight hour, at least eight hours of maintenance while we was shut down. And so the big boss says, oh, David, I need you to work up 30 foot in the air all day and, and work on this, uh, this conveyor system and make sure that it's all right and fix all the parts and fix all the stuff. I said, okay, not a problem. And then he goes, and Sheila, I want you to work with him. Mm -hmm. Let him teach you. And I said, no, he didn't just say that. <laughs> and this is the woman who's been cussing me and carrying on, and I've been trying to be a, a light before her. I said, God, I cannot believe that I'm working on my day off. I'm here, and I'm going to be in a bucket that's only about as big as this all day long with this WWF fighter that wants to talk junk to me all the time. And so I get up and, and right to start with, I'm going, God, you got to help me. God, you got to help me. And I thought about it. I said, wait a minute. This has got to be a divine appointment today. And so as we're going up, I just start thanking God under my breath. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And if it don't work, I'll throw her out. Throw her in there. <laughs> I just go, oops. <laughs> so, <laughs> so while we're up there, something happens. Within five minutes of us being up there, something happens. And she says, she asked me a question, and all of a sudden I start telling her about something that God done with Daniel and how God healed Daniel's cystic fibrosis. And, and she said, come on now, talk to me some more. So I start telling her about Daniel, how sick he was, and how one night God healed him. And, and then she said, if you had any more stories like that, and I start telling some other things. And from that, the rest of the day, all she wanted to do was be tell her things that, that God had done. And then she would start telling me some things. At the end of that day, we became the best of friends. When we got in there, we were the worst of enemies. When we got out of that bucket, at the end of the day, we were the best of friends. And from that time on, she never cussed me again. And we were we were just, I mean, it was just awesome. An absolute awesome relationship. And if anybody else tried to carry on, she would say, no, you leave him alone. <laughs> yeah. And so, so again, you got, God can use some of the weirdest things. In people. Yeah. Just a reminder, there was a basket in the foyer for items for the, the new food pantry Sunday. If mm -hmm. y'all would please bring something, I would be really happy. Okay. And can we end with a song? Yes. I've got two or three good ones. Uh, on the and Friday. Huh? Friday. Oh, Friday. Uh, Mary's Chapel Church is having their Relay for Life pancake supper Friday night, $6, all you can eat. Um, it goes towards their their Relay for Life cancer team that they sponsor every year. It's a good cause. Okay. Um, and awesome. I've been mentioning it, trying to mention that the last few weeks too. Okay. Anyway, I was I was hitting a little YouTube video on Eye of the Storm. Okay. Y'all like I? I love it. I love that song. Let it rip. That's what I'm getting ready to do. Come on here. Well, I think I am. <laughs> I wanted to say something while she's doing it. It's been, it was amazing me to listen to you tonight talking about uh, Jonah and, and uh, Joseph. Uh -huh. Because I'm doing a Bible study and you don't do straight through the Bible. You uh -huh. do different parts of the Bible uh -huh. each day. And that was part of mine this week. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Between the black skies and my red eyes, I can be.
I could sing, and I'm sure y'all do. Me too. Boy, I wish I could sing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you don't know, let me give you a little counter story here. Let me give you a counter story to that song. Like, um, everywhere I go, with the, that, and that's not like children's sign. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Red Bolts. <laughs> yes. All I'm going to say is, the guy that wrote that song, the guy that wrote that song in the eye of the storm, he was a, he was a, on the weekends, he sang gospel music, but his job was he was a paramedic. And he saved a woman's life. And, it, and just his normal work, okay? But he saved a woman's life. And when he saved the woman's life, later on, the woman came back to him and said, she went to one of his concerts or something, and she said, if there's any one thing in this world you could do, what would it be? And he said to sing full-time, make an album and sing full-time. And she wrote him a check right then and there and said, go do it. He said, she said, how much is it to make an album? And he said how much it was, and she wrote him a check right then and said, go make it. Hmm. That's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's me. Yeah. I didn't know that. I heard him talking about that. Are you we got to pray? pray. Yeah, we got to pray. So Father, we love you. We praise learn. your name. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to be in your house, to worship you in spirit and truth. Help us to remember, Lord, that just because we... We get in problems that, that, that it's not always a bad thing. There's a lot of times God uses that problem to, to lead us to greater things. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.